I would like to welcome all to the April 7th meeting of the Cape Cod Commissioners, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have, uh, we have two guests this morning and on a topic that's very important to us and they've been doing a lot of work on it. So we're going to hear and have an update on the solid waste alternative analysis in the Cape Cod Commission and Patty Daly. Thank you. Welcome, Patty. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, with me today is Bruce Haskell from Camp Presser yes. McGee. And uh, they were the consultants who conducted this study for us. The study was... Um, conceived through a committee that you set up, that this commission set up, which is the um, Barnstable County Solid Waste Contract Advisory Committee, made up of representatives of all 15 towns. And uh, there was a, a feeling amongst that committee that we needed to, uh, in the face of some contract um, MOUs that were being put out by CMS, to look at our options for dealing with municipal solid waste into the future. Um, I think you, you know that uh, 14 of the 15 towns have current contracts with CMS for waste disposal. Those are ending in 2015, and so we're now in the process of renego either renegotiating that contract or choosing some other option for waste disposal. And the final thing I want to say is that the study was funded with district local technical assistance funds, which are state funds that um, come straight through the regional planning agencies to the towns. And um, it, that funding has been very helpful to identify regional um, options for our community. So with that, I'll pass it along to Bruce. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. Bruce Haskell from uh, CDM. I'll give a copy of the presentation to pass out, so I'll just start. Um, again, as Patty mentioned, you know, the community, so it was a really solid waste disposal um, agreement in response to some uh, proposals by CMAS to, uh, to accelerate and extend the contracts of the uh, 14 Cape communities. What we do today is really talk to you briefly about um, what we do is talk to you briefly about um, the background, you know, what Cape Waste is, how much money gets spent on Cape Waste, um, what you're paying now versus market. Um, review this proposed CMAS. Now, the CMAS is the waste energy plant, obviously about 12 miles off the Cape in Rochester, where the waste has been going for about 20 years. Um, memorandum of understanding essentially was an extension of the existing contracts. Um, evaluate other future alternatives, and, and we'll talk about a lot of alternatives that are, opt are reasonable and are not. Look at regional options and then some of our conclusions and, and recommendations. Just want to sort of pipe this sort of box in what we, what we looked at here. We really looked at the municipal solid waste, the trash, if you will, that people put out to the, to, to the curb or take to the transfer station. <coughs> and is controlled by the towns. Okay, we did not look at recyclables. That's a potential future study um, that the commission is going to do. Um, and we did not look at how towns collected the waste and got them to, most of them taken to a small transfer station locally, a regional transfer station. Um, so we sort of said, it's on the truck. It's going somewhere. What, what other options and alternatives do we have for it? Just a step back and give you an idea of, of what, what's, go, what's going on in Massachusetts. And this is a, we've got a lot of discussion in the report about this. but. A couple of major factors, about 6.6 .6 million tons of waste either burned in waste energy plants or landfilled in Massachusetts right now. Uh, 1.4 million tons of waste is currently taken out of state. This is a couple of years old, 2008 information. Uh, but MassDEP's estimates, and MassDEP has a major regional uh, statewide planning uh, role in solid waste to promote recycling, reduction of waste, things like that. Um, they estimate that that number is going to climb to 2.5 to 4.1 million tons, primarily because there's a several transfer stations, excuse me, uh, landfills, including one in Taunton, one in Fall River, that are likely to close over the next couple of years. Um, there are several re you know, large regional infrastructure to buy some of those facilities. Just to give you an idea of the background on the Cape uh, Municipal Solid Waste, so we'll use the term MSW or Municipal Solid Waste to describe that portion of the, of the waste stream. Um, currently, for about 20 years, 14 of the towns, all but born, had a, um, have a contract with the CMAS plant in Rochester. They're currently paying market rates that are well below the current market. The current market has dropped over the last two years or so with the economy. 
but essentially the towns are paying, one town, Wellfleet's paying about $18 a ton. The remainder of the communities are paying in the, in the range of $37 a ton. It varies by a dollar or two uh, up and down. But those are sort of the two central median numbers of the, uh, to keep in mind. The waste that we looked at represents about 164,000 tons per year of material. That was a lot of material. Existing, as Patty mentioned, contracts that end around 2015. There is some, again, some variability, and I'm, I'm talking generalities. If you have a specific what town, town question, we can answer that. Um, and obviously, born landfills um, there. So just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the cost, right now, at the current tip fees, the, these community, the communities pay through whatever mechanism they charge the residents um, about $6 million per year to CMAS to dispose of that 164,000 tons of waste. <coughs> Yes, Mr. Ascot, I wonder, could you tell us what the market rate is? It's probably, right now it, it varies. Short term markets probably down to $50 <laughs> ton rate. Long term is, is in the $75 to $85 ton range. Okay. The towns, let I me mean, just, just a background. The towns, when they sign these agreements, signed it at you know, $18 to $25 a ton. And the only thing that's increased it over those years has been a uh, this thing called a change in law provision, which if CMAS has to change how they operate in, regard, in, in response to regulation, they get to back charge the users for that. There is no inflationary adjustment to, to that year's current contracts, and that's why they've stayed, they've sort of fallen behind some of the different things here. Um, the next thing is just how does the waste, once it's, when it's collected, is, is, is hauled directly um, to CMAS, and how does it get there? And there's just a couple of, uh, three different categories. Um, the three, three lower Cape communities, Sandwich, Mashpee, and Falmouth, all take their waste to the Upper Cape Regional Transfer Station, which is located on the Otis, Tran, uh, Otis uh, Air Force Base. It's hauled by rail to CMAS, so the town's shown in sort of the brownish gold. Barnstable and Yarmouth, the blue towns, um, all from local drop-off areas to the Armit Barnstable Rail Transfer Station. Again, it's hauled by rail primarily with rails available to CMAS and all the, um, the, the town communities from Dennis out through the Upper Cape to Provincetown all haul, take it to their transfer station, put it in a truck, and haul it directly um, by truck to, to CMAS and back there. So there's really three separate ways. It's important to note that the rail transfer stations are sort of, you know, on the Cape are sort of a unique thing for hauling such short distances in municipal operations. It's a, it's a, it's a very good, flexible option for you, um, but it's a unique um, situation that you have. There's nowhere else, at least in the Northeast, that I know that does. Do you have anything so. to do with the setup of the uh, uh, of the regional transfer station in, uh, at the Yarmouth Railhead? I don't, I don't have anything. We do some work for Yarmouth, but I don't, we haven't done anything, any work at the transfer okay. station. Because one of the issues for several of the towns that are doing direct hauling is the, you know, is the ability to do a, let's say, uh, an easier transfer at that point. Yes. Um, there, there, there is an agreement, and uh, not to, 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 there is an agreement between Yarmouth and Barnstable and CMAS, and it's, it's supposed to promote those towns to, to drop there versus hauling by truck over the bridges and, and out there. Um, and as, as I know right now, I know that there's been a lot of conversations, but I don't think they've had, anybody has actually signed up for that as, as far as I know. Again, it's probably one old information, but that's something that's there. Certainly that would make some sense. I mean, it's just adding a rail car or two for some of these towns. Um, it would make some sense to do that. When, it, you know, when you talk about solid waste, one of the things you're talking about is tonnages. And it's a little bit hard to read here, but this gives you an idea of um, you know, the rail component and how important that is to the Cape communities, those two towns. And again, solid waste generally links to population. So this, you know, it, 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 you know, the more people you have, the more tonnage that you'll generate. Um, and these are an idea of how many tons per year were generated or, or pushed through these facilities. The blue is uh, 36,000 tons through the Upper Cape, Falmouth, Mashpee, Sandwich communities. The reddish is 50,000 tons, which is direct haul from the um, lower Cape communities. And the green is from Yarmouth and Barnstable. I mean, Barnstable has committed under their CMAS agreement to almost 50,000 tons a year of waste out of a total of 164,000 for the entire Cape. So it's a large, it's a very large portion of the, of the waste stream. That's represented in Yarmouth as frankly number two. So that's represented in the green. But this gives you, the takeaway from this is really how important rail is because the Blue and the green are going off by rail right now uh, to CMAS, which has the ability to tip those. As Patty mentioned, um, about the last about a year ago, CMAS uh, approached the communities with a proposed memorandum of understanding to do some things to, to do some things in the last five years of their agreement with the towns, and then to sign a 15-year extension. 
Um, it was negotiated with this group called the Council of CMAS Communities, which are all the communities that have long-term contracts in southeastern Mass um, with CMAS, including a couple of communities from the Cape. Um, it would extend the agreement, these what they call waste acquisition agreements, legal terminology, by 15 years or until about 2030. Um, it was offered to the 14 Cape communities that currently go there, um, but the, and it was an idea of locking in a future 2015 tipping fee at a certain rate, um, but the cost of that was, we'll show some graphics to that, um, to this effect, was that the tipping fee for those communities would increase over the next five years uh, by 40 to 45 dollars a ton, and it was essentially 250 a ton this year. This is a little bit, you know, we're going back because nobody actually, well, nobody um, agreed to this thing. Uh, 2011, it would go up by 750 more incrementally, so 10 dollars total, and 10, 10, 10, and so up there to 40 or 45 dollars um, a ton, depending on whether tip fee was now wealthy, was going to go up higher than than some of the other communities. So, what this graphic shows is just the red is where if, if the town had signed an MCNS MOU entered into the extension agreement, where their tip fee would be up until the high 70s, about $77 a ton, roughly. And the blue is where it would be now um, if it is uh, stayed at the, same, at the same level. And obviously, the, there's no change in law, what I talked about before, factored into this. This is just sort of if everything goes to score the plan in the next five years. So what we did is we took a look at different market rates for, um, for the waste out there for, for uh, 2015. So we said, look, we'll put the crystal ball, we're going to see what's going to happen in 2015. And if, you, if a town was to pay those upfront payments, how, how long would it take to get the money back in today's dollars? So how long would it take to get, get the, the money that you put in now back at different market rates? And we looked at $80 a ton, $90 a ton, and $100 a ton. Um, we also did a survey of a lot of other waste energy contracts in eastern Massachusetts, um, out through central Mass, and found that the, the, you know, the market for those contracts in 2015 was going to be in the $80 to $85 a ton range um, out there, which I just want to note, that is double, more than double what the communities are now paying. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important um, to, keep them, to keep in mind. So what we did is we took a look and we did a, a series of these. Um, and again, this is where a town, this is for the 13 of the 14 towns are paying around $37 a ton. Um, you can see that the reddish line is sort of paying the same amount now, $37 a ton, and then it jumps to $90 a ton, which is what the, the, the communities could negotiate, and then they would pay by an acceleration of an inflation accelerator. It's very unusual that these contracts that you have do not have an inflation increase of some sort. Okay, um, so that's unusual. The blue line is sort of showing the ramping up of the payments over the next few years. And then, again, increasing by the accelerator. Again, no change in law here. It's unpredictable and would affect both of these in a similar manner. Um, so what, I, what we did is we have our you know, return on investment, or ROI. And in this scenario, it took about 11 years to reclaim the value of the upfront payment. So the money the towns are putting up now through 2015, you wouldn't really get it back in current dollars for another 11 years after that. And again, we think the market's going to be somewhere in the 80s. Um, at that point. And again, it's just a table sort of summarizing it. Um, again, wealth, uh, the case communities, um, the 80, 90, $100 a ton, obviously the higher it goes, the quicker the payback um, in the future market. And then wealth fleet, because they're, they're paying um, only $18 a ton, if the market will be that much higher at that point, they're, they're in sort of a different category um, out there. And it's the, point, the difference between wealth fleet and the rest of the towns is that they don't have a change in law kicker or an increaser in their contract. Okay, so the $19 a ton difference is the change in laws over the last 20 years or so, primarily. And how long does the wealth fleet contract run for? It runs to 2016. <coughs> they're they're out of a, they're a little bit on a different they're they're a little bit on a different schedule um, out there. So um, out there, there's a little it's in a report we have tables for all the communities and when theirs ends, and they, they probably know this, but it's it's they, they do vary a little bit um, off and on. I'm just trying to give a, a, a 2,000 foot picture here, so. All right, so the, again, what we did was we returned the uh, upfront investment, depending on tip fees being significantly below market in 2015 under the MOU. Um, and our recommendation, with the exception of wealth fleet, it doesn't appear, I mean, I don't believe that the communities are looking right now to take money in today for a 10 year, you know, for a payback in 2025. Um, um, and that was the sense also from the committee when we presented a lot of this information to the representatives of the town administrators and public works people uh, within the thing. Uh, the other thing to point out is Bourne was quoting about $71 a ton. We'll talk about the options, the other options you have for municipal contracts 
which would be in the low to mid 80s with a, a, a you know three percent CPI um, China, uh, consumer price index, which is an inflation measure uh, increase back there. And the 74 to 78 dollars is the projected market rate based on the future contracts. So what we did is we the next thing we did is okay. The, you know, the towns don't sign a CMAS MOU. They've got five years to figure out what to do next. Um, so what we did was we took and we um, looked at the options that they might have to negotiate and to do an RFP. And, and, and again, Pat, the Pat Solways Committee is looking at that, um, doing something there. And there's um, seven or eight options. Obviously, CMAS waste energy facility is still an option. I mean, it's still a very viable, very reliable source for getting rid of the town's MSW. Bourne Landfill has all the permits to take all the towns. MSW if, if, if needed, or some of the town's MSW. Um, there's a transfer station about a mile on, on, uh, down from south of CMAS facility. It's operated by Casella Waste um, that could take that and dispose of it at a more distant South Bridge, which is in the Sturbridge area, um, or facilities in southern Maine out there. Um, the towns do have the option, again, the rail transfer stations to take it and send it to Ohio, and, and that's where a lot of that increase in waste is going to. There are transfer stations in Brockton and different areas in Boston that are sending waste um, to very distant Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, transfer state, uh, uh, landfills out there. And the tipping fees, the disposal fees at those sites are very, very low. Um, but obviously, it costs more to get there, so it's, it's a balance. Um, one thing that came up out of this study was there's a landfill in uh, Dartmouth that uh, uh, Crapel Hill landfill that's run by the city of New Bedford and the town of Dartmouth, and they were looking for about 20,000 tons a year, um, but they're looking for it now. Isn't that the one near the airport, or is that a different? No, one? that's Fall River. Fall River's there. Fall River's next to the Fall River Airport. When you go down 90, 195, I, yeah. there was a. I thought Crapel Hill was on 195. No, it's uh, it's up 140. It's it's almost you, you almost go out of uh, the New, Be New Bedford Industrial Park. Where yeah, I used to work there. So it's the one beyond that. It's the one beyond that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's one that's right at the 140, 195 interchange of Charlotte Ave. That's the old city dump, the, the, the landfill that's up there. That's that's cap closed and taken care of at this point. Um, and then there's a, a small landfill in Middleborough that the town owns and waste management operates. Their ton their their tonnage is uh, a lot of tonnage, like 200 tons a day. It's really not a big, it might be good for some of the smaller communities, but it's not really going to be a big option. And then we talked a lot about uh, future technologies, and, and I, I can get into those if you'd like, but, um, you know, the state always has its always master plans. I mentioned the state has a very big role. Um, they uh, extended a moratorium on incinerating solid waste about uh, December, about half of when we were working on this report. Um, that moratorium, although I, you know, you're reading between the lines of it, not sure exactly, they haven't come out with the actual formal document. Um, sort of puts a, uh, um, the end to a lot of the uh, uh, future technologies that are out there. I mean, it's, it sort of really limits some of these technologies because they are somewhat burning technologies out there that are out there. So that, that changed a lot of things there. So just to do that. So that's so at the end of the day, we really felt that the four options that really took that would be available in 2015 would be a look at CMAS board transportation in Rochester, and then long-term, long-distance long, long distance rail haul. And this is just a graphic, again, it's this graphic of how things get there and, you know, roughly where things are located um, in, in accordance with, you know, foreign landfill, I mean, you know where these things are um, out there, you know, as far as getting the waste to those locations. All these, all these, these three disposal locations are all very closely, I mean, you know, very closely located to each other. Can I just ask, what's sure. the estimated life of the foreign landfill? How much capacity is that? It in? has, I mean, depending on how much waste, the rate of waste between 15 and 20 years left within the existing approved footprint, mm -hmm. there is area to expand, but they would have to get that locally permitted and permitted by the state. And uh, I just note that Phil Goddard is here as well from the town of Bourne. Morning. 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 So well, we looked at two things, cost and non-cost. You know, engineers are simple, you have to put things in, 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 <laughs> into play the thing. So we looked at the total cost for MSW disposal is, is equivalent to what, what it takes for a resident to get it to their curbside collection. And the only town that really offers town-wide curbside collection paid for a bit of town is Talmud. Um, Plus what it takes to haul from the local transfer station, you know, Barnstable to haul to the Yarmouth Regional Transfer Station, and then haul it to CMAS or, or Bourne or whatever. Um, and then what the tipping fee is at the disposal facility, um, and that's is the, the payment to whoever operates a big Bourne or, or CMAS out there. What we did is we said that the top line, how the towns get it there, 
it, that's that's we're not going to say we're saying that's not going to change substantially with this. They're still going to have the same basic townwide infrastructure. If they change it, that's a local decision um, to be made by the, the by the communities based on how they pay for their waste and and different methods like that, and just local choice. So we really only looked at the bottom two items out there uh, of that. And then we looked and, and we, we approached each of these facilities um, and at, that we were talking to and asked for a, a projected 2015 tip fee. And surprisingly, they were not willing to give us a, an estimate in 2015 for what it would cost to, um, for disposal or commit to anything um, solid. So we said, all right, we'll look at transportation costs and just the relative transportation cost of um, for the three different major haulers out there. And again, on the Cape Direct Claw, but this is an amalgamation of those of those um, eight towns out there that that's out there. So this, it varies by town and how they haul and things like that. But it's sort of a comparison here, um, and you know, of, of hauling by rail from Yarmouth and in, in, in the Upper Cape, um, and hauling by truck, uh, rail to Seamass, and hauling by truck for every other other option here. And, and what you essentially see is the, the hauling by rail from Yarmouth. Is cheaper than even hauling to board. I mean, it's it, it's it's in the same ballpark. And again, whether it's sixteen or seventeen dollars a ton, that's in the rounding and fuel costs and, and different things like that. As far as in two thousand fifteen, and obviously hauling to Rochester by truck is more than hauling by rail um, out there. So for Yarmouth and Barnstable, um, that makes sense. The Upper Cape transfer station is cheaper to haul by truck to Bourne because Bourne is several miles away from the transfer station than it is to put it on a rail car. Um, and, and, and do that. And just a, well, the, the, the towns, all, all the towns, those the Yarmouth and Upper Cape have a long-term contract that matches the CMAS contract with the uh, Mass Coastal Railroad to haul their haul their waste um, there. So that's those what those numbers are based on. And then obviously hauling to Rochester or CMAS by truck is the same um, for that. And similarly, um, the Cape direct haul it gets a little bit less to haul the board by truck because Bourne is 12 miles closer. I mean, it's pretty it's close there. Isn't there rail access or spur uh, on that rail that, would, that goes into the Bourne landfill? No, there's not. So there's no, uh, there, we talked about that a little bit. There's no, there's no rail, there's no rail access, and I think it'd be a fairly expensive um, thing to put in. in place. Okay, so so the the bottom line is that uh, the only access for Bourne at this point is truck. <coughs> okay, and the and this rail traffic. You know, that we're talking about. We, we have got. You know, there had been some conversation. I think there was one hauler that took some exception to you know, the, the, the difference in cost, uh, and was making a case that truck, you know, truck hauling at the time of that contract was less than you know than rail, not saying than rail transport. Has that been? It, it, it was, has that been addressed in? Uh, you know, we we did not address that specific. I mean, it's really more. It's really an issue for the Upper Cape Transfer Station. I think that's where. That's where. I think that's where the comment came from. Because I heard that same comment <coughs> um, bouncing around. We did not look at hauling by truck to CMAS or by um, rail to CMAS. You know, what, what, you know that was the, that was the option that would would, would be there. Um, presumably, when the commu those communities. Um, you know, sandwich mash being found got together at the end of the day, at the end of their CMAS contract, they would look at the operations of that transfer station and sort of do an all-in cost thing. It's not just the, the hauling, if they have bond payments on the transfer station that they still have to make and you know, labor within the, you know, off to move the materials around. I mean, so to sort of take a look at that and decide what the best way to go based on where they decide to go at the, at the end of the day. The other point to make is Bourne is still a member of the Upper Cape Transfer Station, Regional Transfer Station. So they're still you know, they're participating, but they're not not taking their waste there. So, well, the, well, recently they, they were taking. I think was it three years ago? Fully started taking MSW. Uh, about five years ago, five actually. Years ago. Yeah. So I guess it's been longer than I thought. That's yeah, time flies. <laughs> so I, I think the, one of the important things to take about this graphic is the differences in, um, you know, with maybe the exception of the Upper Cape going to Bourne. Differences between these tip fees are incidental to, excuse me, between these hauling costs are incidental compared to what the disposal fees are going to be per ton. I mean, they're, you know, a few dollars per ton, and it's not going to necessarily drive the process um, of how, how what the towns elect to do on a cost basis. Okay, so I think that's an important, you know, it, you know two or three dollars a ton is, is, you know, there are contract conditions, but change in laws and how that gets divided and things like that that will eat through that that difference. And that's, that, that's you know, we're probably the takeaway from this because obviously this is based on fuel prices today. I knew what fuel prices were going to do it. And take some bets there, so. Okay. Um, and again, this is just sort of a summary of what I said before. Um, you know, the Bourne is, is less expensive for the Cape communities, closer, um, least expensive. CMAS rail haul, 
is uh, less expensive than REP truck haul um, based on the costs that are out there today. Um, and again, I, you know, remember that upper, the, the, the rail costs are um, based on an existing contract. That contract may change five, you know, five years from now. So I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's another thing to look at as far as that goes. Um, and as, as mentioned, it can be um, offset by tipping fees or even contract conditions. I mean, some of these contract conditions have a significant impact on long-term risk and long-term costs for the communities. Um, the only firm proposal was the CMAS MOU for disposal fees, and as I, I um, said before, the, the RFP, you're going to require an RFP and negotiations to determine firm pricing um, out there. So now we, we took a look at other non-cost issues related to, uh, to it, and obviously one of the, you know, there's three things that were identified by the group um, and by, the, by, the, um, by, by Patty that we want to look at. One is just truck traffic around and over the bridges. Okay, so I mean, this is a significant amount of waste that's going moving around there, and if it goes from rail to truck, there's a significant difference uh, what could happen out there. Um, there was a, a desire to discuss greenhouse gases, and I'll just preface this by saying that has been the one of the, the most uh, uh, interesting and challenging parts of this project, surprisingly enough. I thought it was a fairly simple analysis, but it turned into a lot of things. And then there was a discussion of how much energy gets generated from a town's ton of waste uh, by going to these different options. Um, and taking a look at that, how much kilowatt hours per ton of waste can be generated um, as a benefit, you know, as another benefit to the, to the communities. So the first thing we looked at, and again, I, I just did, you know, the 164,000 tons, 113,000 odd is, is, is currently hauled by rail. So it's on the order of, you know, 60, 70% of the, of the waste is currently hauled by rail. And what this graphic shows is, um, because Bourne is sort of on this side of the, of, uh, the Cape side of the canal, you know, trips to the canal, running along the, Cape, the canal roadways, and then trips over the bridge um, for the different options for just the, um, just the Cape community. So, you know, for CMAS, obviously, in the red, it's 49 trucks a day. And again, this is an average over the tonnage over the year. Summer, there is a, there is a fluctuation um, of, of these trips, um, summer versus winter time. Um, and then on the trips to the canal, obviously, Bourne and going to Rochester would be the same. But you can see it's about a jump of about... Uh, 80 trucks per day, uh, you know, on average, uh, week per week, round trips going to and back. So it's a trip to and back going to that those locations. Um, over the bridge, obviously, for, say CMAS stays the same, assuming this is continuing to haul by rail. Um, there's no trips over the bridge to go to Bourne. They go right to the bridge and come come around, or go directly up um, from Falmouth, and then on, on, our, on uh, Rochester Environmental Park. Um, that's there. But the takeaway from this is obviously. Going with another alternative will create some additional traffic at times around the, around the bridges because those Rochester Environmental Park and Bourne don't have access to the rail. They don't have the ability to, 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 uh, to accept and dump rail cars. And right, now for this part that, that I, I, I might not be able to answer all your questions on, I'll try to, but um, greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, this is a huge issue, and, and it's, it's not just a... Uh, uh, an environmental issue, I believe, it, it speaks directly to the change in law, change in law requirements for each of these technologies. Because this is obviously this is going to be regulated more in the future, and these facilities, both landfill, we're talking about landfills and waste energy plants, are going to be required to do things that they're going to pass back to um, the communities to help pay for it, to you know, to, to deal with carbon and, and carbon dioxide emissions into it. But what we did is we looked at total greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and then we looked at we looked at it in certain components. We said, how much does it take to transport the waste around, either by truck or by rail? And that's just burning diesel fuel, and, and how much emissions are from that. And just to point out, that is a very small portion of what we're talking about here, as far as percentages. If you've ever done a greenhouse gas analysis, vehicle trips tend to be a very small portion of it compared to heating and, and, and things like that. We looked at how much would be disposed of, uh, generated from the Excuse disposal me. site. Before you leave that, uh, sure. the Cape is a is an area of significant thermal inversion, and uh, what I'm wondering about is, you know, how much is that contributing to you know, to, to this particular you know, impact? Not at all. This is purely a truck driving down the road. What goes up the, the out of the exhaust of the truck, or the stack of of CMAS, or the flare at uh, at the landfill. It, it, it's just a pure total number um, out there. As far as air, we didn't get into air pollution, you know, NOx, and uh, you know, nitrous oxides, things like that. To, to take a look at those. There's some information about that, but this is more of a, um, a total bulk amount that's just could be generated by a ton of waste. In, in the 
in the experience or the training that I had in that, you, you're supposed to look at you know the, what, what is you know what is uh, uh, sent at ground level versus what is sent at, you know at the higher stacks because those in terms of impact have you know have a different cumulative effect. Yes, for for the air pollution, yeah. you know, the, the, not nitrous oxide, you know, the SOX, sulfur dioxide things, um, but for carbon dioxide, it's really a bulk number type of thing. It's a total emissions type of number. And again, I, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just, okay. you know, again, I can um, take a look at it. And we did provide some information on the relative um, emissions from each type of facility in the report. So, okay. you know, other other emissions. Um, is this safe fact? The total emissions from the disposal site, um, waste energy. Any carbon that goes into a waste energy plant, or 99% of it, gets burned, gets you know turned into carbon dioxide. You know, so carbon, you know, carbon to oxygen. So it's essentially all the carbon, um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts cups, uh, um, you know, plastic bottles, food waste, all that material gets turned into carbon dioxide uh, and sent up the stack. Landfills operate a little bit differently. That waste goes into a um, a, a cell and it sat, sits there and the um, the landfill, the bugs <coughs> eat the, the, the organic part of the waste and generate methane, okay, which is uh, um, um, the carbon and four hydrogens essentially. So, and, and that's there, but there's a lot less, there's a lot more of the carbon, plastic bottles, Dunkin' Donut cups, all those things, never generates anything that gets emitted um, from a landfill. The flip side of that is methane, as a pure greenhouse gas, is 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's. Um, so the balance that, that you get into as far as the total emissions um, from that thing. And that is the bulk of what we're, what we're talking about. And then what the standard way of doing this is to, um, any of these options, you know, landfills can burn waste, can increasingly burn their methane and generate electricity. Obviously waste energy plants, that's, the, that's the, one of the points of them. Um, you take out a, um, an amount, and as we use the New England average, of how much carbon dioxide is getting emitted just from generating a megawatt of, of electricity. Um, so it's you know, so you sort of get a credit back for the electricity that you generate because presumably that's avoiding somebody burning coal, nuclear, or whatever other hydroelectric, whatever other parts of it out are are uh, out there. Okay, and again everything is is calculated as metric tons of carbon dioxide. So methane gets multiplied, the amount of methane gets multiplied times 21 to give it a, a sort of an equivalency um, factor here. So what we came up with, and I just put it in bullets instead of numbers here for you today, just um, there, was uh, the emissions from hauling. Obviously, the rail is less than the truck, and it's dependent on mileage. It's fuel. It's fuel being burned um, up there. The farther the MSW gets hauled, taking the waste to Rochester's transfer station and hauling it to southern Maine or, or anywhere else would generate more emissions than just taking it to CMAS um, out there or born out there. Um, the gas the methane is typically flared. Um, waste energy carbon dioxide and the credit we, that we provided you and the regulatory agencies accounting of greenhouse gases versus total emissions. And that's what I wanted to just talk to you about. I've given a table out a couple of times and Patty's smiling here because it's, it's caused a great deal of controversy about what gets, the way the European Union or EPA counts what goes into a landfill um, and what generates that is different than what goes into a waste energy plant. So the table has become rather complicated there, and what we've done is we've said two things. We said, all right, how would a regulatory agency look at that, um, and you know, look at the total emissions and what number would they, what number would they assign to that? What number would a CMAS or board be required to report? And then we looked at it more simplistically. If a town has a ton of trash on the on the floor, a ton of waste on the floor of their transfer station, they want they want to take it to a landfill, they want to take it to a waste energy plant how much greenhouse gases would be emitted. And it, it all comes into um, the greenhouse gases and the life cycle analysis. And it all comes into you know, that organic waste that's going to a waste energy plant, presumably took up carbon, you know, the vegetable took up carbon when it was, when it was growing. So it's, it's essentially a net zero um, in the way it's reported. But it does emit carbon dioxide. Okay? And I cannot fully understand that, but that's, 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 that's what we're trying to sort of show both of those analysis out there. Can I just ask a question on the emissions from hauling? How much is rail less than a truck for each ton hauled a mile? I, I, guess, I, I, I No, it's not half. Uh -huh. it's, 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 a, it's only like a third less okay. and stuff like that, so for a ton mile. And rail has an advantage. The further you go, the better, you know, so the, the better it gets. I mean, in some in some ways and stuff, so it's it's very um, 
And well, when I, I, because when I might say that is because if you were to go further with your waste, you would put more cars on than you do now. Now it's they take three to four trips depending on the season from those transfer stations. If they were to go to Ohio, it would be larger trains, and the fuel consumption per ton of waste in that when that train would, would go down. The final thing we looked at was just the, the difference in um, how much energy gets generated for a ton of waste that goes to these facilities. Uh, waste energy plants generate about 550 kilowatt hours per ton, um, about twice what a landfill with an effective landfill gas collection system will generate. Um, and these are sort of standard numbers that are out there in the literature um, and things like that. But that's, and again, it ranges based on how wet your waste is and what kind of materials are there, how effective the collection system of the gas is. But these are sort of standard numbers that are out there um, to, to give you an idea that the advantage is generating some electricity from your waste. Okay. Um, just want to note, Ford and Southbridge do not, landfills do not currently have landfill gas energy plants. We've talked to both of them, um, and they both are intending to have one by 2015. So this will be perspective for 2015. Okay. Last thing we looked at it, and, and, uh, was looking at some regional options and how the towns could put together some things. And one example came up and, and, and was the Greater New Bedford Regional Refuge District, which has uh, operated a landfill since 93. It was in existence since the late 70s and had several towns um, drop off, add, you know, do some different things. There's an appointed board with representatives from both communities. Um, their estimated total operating cost for disposal, remember I told you market is, is in the 80s, 70s to 80s, is $40 per ton. That's what costs them to put a ton of trash all in, put a west side money for closure, do everything they need to do out there. Um, out there. They subsidize their costs for the communities with a higher tip fee for outside parties. So they sell waste to commercial vendors or other communities at $70 a ton. And the net out is those two communities pay something in the order of $20 a ton um, for their waste disposal and have for a long period of time, net out that the actual municipality pays. And their advice was to limit debt and maintain cash reserves. I think the, the point here is that, you know, Bourne is a similar type of facility, a similar asset for the Cape communities. Um, and maybe there's a justification for some or all of the communities to take a look at that and take a look at this as a model as something that you could do um, around the Bourne landfill and, uh, and see if they, and as, as an option to reduce costs um, and also to do other things with the Bourne landfill um, that they have permits for to improve recycling, improve waste diversion, improve processing of recyclables, those kinds of things. Okay. The other um, regional option and that, that the communities are presenting is to sort of negotiate as a group. And the model that we'll, we talked about here is the um, Worcester area, Central Mass Community Towns, about four or five years ago, uh, banded together and uh, negotiated with a facility in Millbury, which is right off the Mass Pipe on, on Route 122, um, to negotiate a new long-term agreement with the plant operator. And that was effective. They, they had some very good things and improved the, the CPI. They only pay a percentage of the CPI, which makes a big difference over time. And they really, you know, the change in law. The other advantage is you can combine your legal and technical. I mean, obviously, every town council is going to have to approve the agreement, and every town is going to individually go through their process. But, you know, you really, if you retain a single legal, legal and technical person to negotiate the best possible deal, there, it's, it just spreads that cost out instead of every community um, doing that. Um, there, it's required to sort of go in as a group, and this is actually an ongoing process that the communities are taking. So, finally, conclusions. Um, you know, again, it's thirty-seven dollars a ton, and these are our recommendations. Um, and they should, that the communities that pay that right now should not sign the CMS MOU. There's not a return on that. Um, to prepare the RFP, and again, we evaluate alternatives for transportation. Um, the collection and disposal processes. I think this is an opportunity for each of the communities to take a look at what they do and whether that makes sense okay, for them financially and for them um, you know, as far as how they pay for waste and how they do things. I think a lot of communities are doing that. Um, confirm the guaranteed annual tonnages, and I didn't touch on this, but it's important. Every town in these contracts is required to deliver a certain amount of waste, plus or minus 10% to, to CMAS. You, you, I just make sure you can deliver that. Okay, because that you you will pay for that regardless um, under the, under these agreements, um, and so you know make sure whatever that tonnage is, if you change around how you do things, and the biggest difference is there's a lot of towns have subscription haulers, you know the people uh, resident goes and hires Joe's hauling to haul their waste. 
They go to the local transfer station. Well, if that transfer station triples in cost, he may just go somewhere else. Or he may go to Bourne or if, you know, to, the, you know, to that transfer station, and that waste is outside of your control to a large degree. So I think it's very important in the communities, and we, we emphasize numerous times to the people in the committee, make sure whatever number you sign on the line for, you've got control and you have the ability to, to provide to, um, to whatever disposal facility they choose. And again, the change in law, very complicated, very complex, who pays for it, how much it gets spread about, that's really a legal, a much more legal issue. Um, but there are some really bad agreements that got bad because of that, of that provision, um, really bad. I mean, you know, towns in the northern North Andover area were paying $150 a ton at one point based on poor change in law of management and, and, and agreements. And then price escalation, um, one of the things with CMS is that a full CPI, typically it's a percentage of CPI um, without a carry, any kind of carry over if it goes over a certain percent. Um, we get, we recommend that the communities have some initial discussions with Bourne to you know, look at a viable a viability of a regional district, not just for MSW disposal, um, but for other recycling related um, things which are sort of outside the task but would make sense based on our um, knowledge of, of the, what's going on here. Um, one of the things you have to do is evaluate your recycling programs. The commission's looking to, to do that in the near future um, and their impact on tonnages and costs. A typical condition in a contract with disposal facilities that a town recycles a ton of waste, they're not, they're not committed to guarantee it. So that's a, something you want to make sure that's in, the, in whatever contracts you enter into so there's no double penalty for recycling. I mean, you know, you're paying to recycle it and then paying to um, you know, dispose of it at a place there. Um, evaluating emerging technologies, um, we, we've been awaiting the state solid master plan. Again, the state takes deep, mass DP takes a very significant role in telling, you know, and sort of laying out what can do, what can happen out there, um, and sort of filling in the blanks between this. I mean, co-composting, if you what Nantucket does um, out there is a, is a possibility for some of it. There's food waste composting proposals, uh, even on the Cape. Um, out there, and then you know those things can incorporate wastewater residuals. Those will def that will definitely be in the within the um, the master plan and allowable. But we want to try to you know sort of take a look at that and, and see what um, other things might be emerging technologies. One of the conclusions of our report, though, is that if you were to say to me, I've got a site in Town A, I want to build a facility to take all the Cape waste and process it today, we don't believe you can get all the permits, get up and running, and be ready to go by 2015. But it's something for the communities to keep in, in mind, you know, because it, it's a multi-step process and, and a lot of public input and a lot of process that you have to go through. As I mentioned, the incinerator moratorium and monitor what goes on with greenhouse gases because that's going to affect a lot of what you know the costs are and the change in the law um, out there. And that's all I had for you. <laughs> Can I answer any questions that you have? I wonder if it would be useful to have uh, Phil. Uh, comment on this since uh, he represents a born sure. landfill. Good morning. Thanks for having me here and for uh, the commission for letting us know about this. And I'm here on behalf of the town with uh, Tom Greeno's uh, new town administrator's endorsement. And as, as Bruce indicated, we are an option for the Cape communities in a number of ways. Um, just so you, you understand what our site is, it, we're, we're called integrated solid waste management because that's what we really are. We have a 100 acre parcel, 75 of which is for the landfill. And we have about 3.8 million cubic yards of airspace projected to remain in that 75 acre area with various phases. It's not all lined right now, but it will be at some point. The other 25 we bought about eight years ago, nine years ago, and we had site assigned by the Board of Health for everything other than landfilling or incineration. So we can do pretty much all these new technologies, transfer. Currently, we have a CMD transfer station, which is construction demolition materials. It's a building, tip floor, and a loadout facility. We have a bailing facility, high-speed baler for recycling, and we've talked about maybe consolidating recycling on the Cape, single source, single stream through Bourne as an option. And we have the landfill, of course. Um, so that being said, there's a number of things we can participate in on a regional basis. We could look at taking the MSW right in the landfill, uh, certainly, and we could also look at partnering with the Cape Towns in some sort of negotiation whereby, through an intermunicipal agreement, we agree to take the waste from the Cape Towns, but then possibly negotiate with CMAS in some sort of uh, 
equal footing, if you will, for an arrangement where we take some of the bypass from CMAS and their ash. Because they still need a landfill. What gets overlooked in these equations sometimes is that CMAS has a landfill of their own. That landfill is closing within a short period of time, maybe five years. So they're going to need a place to go. When the boilers are down, they're still obligated to take that waste, and they need to go to either another incinerator or another landfill. And then they have the ash that they have. They have bottom ash, and then they have fly ash, two different types of streams. But currently, we take their uh, bottom ash for daily cover and disposal. So we have a role to play in any event in the region. So what we're evaluating internally with our leadership is What's the best way to work with the Cape Towns? Is it individual contracts? Is it providing disposal capacity for all the Cape Towns as a block, which would be about, about 150,000 tons? Would it be partnering with the towns in an intermusal agreement situation and negotiating as a unit that says we have a landfill and we have this much waste to bring to the table and what could you do for us in 2015? These are the things that we're looking at. Regardless, I think Bourne wanted to make sure that the message is that we're also there for other things, whichever way you go. Now, having a 100-acre site that's site assigned is an industrial facility on a highway, not next to neighborhoods, uh, that could produce energy in a variety of forms. We're even looking at taking the gas and piping it directly into the gas pipeline rather than making energy out of it, which makes the emissions less. It is a valuable asset to the county in, in a variety of ways. So that's all developing rapidly, and the real short-term pressure was whether the towns wanted to sign this agreement or not. My understanding is that Plymouth voted it down at their town meeting. Did they? Yes. They had voted, the, the Solid Waste Committee said, we want to sign it. The Finance Committee said no. They had a big battle at town meeting floor, and, and my understanding is that they voted down signing that deal. Brewster did sign the MOU. I don't know where they are in their process. It was the only one. Uh, but it seems that most of the towns have said, we're going we're to pass on that and see where we go. And Bourne has said, we're willing to look at bringing something to the table beginning in 2015 in the range of uh, what we talked about, I think $70 now you know, escalated at that point in time. But there's four more, five more years to go before we be now and then. And, and obviously the longer the towns wait, the less leverage they have because then they're going to need a new home. You know, if you're waiting until the end of 2014, 2015, your, 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 your options are less. Bruce is absolutely right. The new technologies were severely limited. Ton is proposing now a $650 million MSW to ethanol facility via gasification. Ethanol is a type of biofuel. That same technology could have produced energy, but the interpretation of the state is that that biogas, or that syngas rather, which is uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, would be equivalent to combusting it at CMAS, so they didn't want to do that. They, they prohibited that. So that's a lot of money for a facility. Um, so there may be some hybrid technologies with the biosolids and food wastes. There are technologies for digesting things that could supplement revenue at Bourne we're looking at. Uh, these are questions that the town of Bourne leadership is evaluating and addressing, and what we've been talking to Patty and Bruce about is how to move forward in the near future. We are an enterprise fund within the town of Bourne, so we're not funded by the taxes at all. I'm a town employee. The department's a town department, yet we operate as an independent financial entity. We have an enterprise fund, so we have to pay for all our debt and employees, the day-to-day -day operations. So in, in the meantime, we're... We're going concern, and we have to take in ways to, to be viable. And so we need to figure out how to, how to do that in the short term to position ourselves for the long term. We're continuing to make infrastructure improvements to improve our scale and traffic flow. But essentially, the major improvements for utilities, uh, paving, permitting, all the things that Bruce mentioned would take an enormous amount of time and energy for another site, we've, we've done all that. And it would be a simple modification through the DRI with the Cape Cod Commission and then MEPA to modify that to go forward. So we have a huge lead on a greenfield or brownfield project somewhere else. And that brings something to the table. And that, those are the, the key points I wanted to make. 
Um, we're hoping that in the near future, in the next few months, we could start to get some clear direction uh, about what our leadership and the, the towns in the Cape or, or would like to do to go forward to maybe do a partnership and get to the next steps on that. Because there are some legal questions and negotiating uh, questions. What's the best way to do that? Do you want to go up for an RFP? Do you want to do an intermunicipal agreement now, which doesn't require an RFP? We've done those types of agreements with the Cape Towns before way back when we took the non-MSW stuff, the bulky wastes and things, when we started the facility. So those are questions that I think are all valid around the table for the communities. And uh, another big one essentially is, does each town want to negotiate individually? That That's a big difference that I see as an opportunity for the towns. Do you want to have province town negotiate independently and then have Falmouth and so forth and so on? Um, and rail, of course, is factored into this. It's, it's pretty clear from Mass Coastal's comments that without MSW as their product to haul, they're pretty much not viable right now. They don't see anything else that's going to be their main business. And I know that people have a, a strong sense they want to see rail remain on the Cape for a variety of reasons down the road. So that, that's a factor there we have to consider as well. So uh, how it, how it move, shakes out, if you will, in the next year or two, it's still unknown, but I think we're, we're at the point where we have a good baseline study. The issues are on the table. And it's to the respective leaderships now at each town, the selectmen level. I think it's been pretty much at the superintendent level at these meetings to start weighing in about how they like to move forward. And, and we're moving forward on the same side to prepare our leadership to determine what steps they would like to make and offer concretely to go forward. So that's kind of where we are right now. I think there's an opportunity here in the next year or so I will say also, though, that as an enterprise fund in a tough economy, we took about a 30% hit in our revenues in FY09. We have to look at being viable for our own town balance sheet and income statement. So uh, we have taken some town contracts, uh, one actually Hanover, and some local commercial contracts, short-term contracts. But we are also looking at other longer-term contracts from other towns, some off the Cape. So as time goes by, we may be in a position where we have to start looking at securing some of those contracts to keep our business model viable, then that reduces the available space for everyone else. So there's an opportunity there to, to explore those options, and it's our hope that we can start to, to move it to the next level to determine which way everybody would like to go. Uh, certainly there is that carbon sink thing that uh, where you're, you're sequestering some carbon. Uh, that, that you really can get into all sorts of uh, complicated analyses that Bruce mentioned between anthropogenic, you know, is it produced by man or is it natural and net zero? It is true, but does, carbon does come back out of the form of, of uh, CH4 methane, and we do have the ability at this point to put a couple of megawatts out there. We're, we're, we're determining how to do that. We are a member of the Cape Light Compact and the Cape in Vineyard Electrical Cooperative. And we've been very interested in looking at possibilities of working through that arrangement for power on our site, which could benefit the county as well. The other factor that is uh, something that is interesting that was mentioned to us by a consultant is that their, their CMAS's energy contract is expiring around the time these contracts expire. So they're going to be looking to sell power. There may be an option that the towns could factor into that as well to buy their green power. So there's all sorts of interesting angles here. Um, as with the, go yes. any further, I'd just yep. like to give the commissioners time to ask some yep. questions. That's my basic um, speech. So right. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you for that. That was very helpful. I just have a question for you. Have you solved the order problem yet? We have contained it to the point where it's not a problem currently. Oh. Um, it's always a day-to-day -day operational challenge in a landfill to make sure that you don't have an odor problem. The main culprit of the odor problem is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide generally comes from the decomposition in the absence of oxygen of wallboard. When it's crushed up in the form of powder and fines, we took a lot of those C&D fines, uh, it can over time produce hydrogen sulfide. What we've done is we've capped on an interim basin basis the area that was a problem put in a whole series of vertical gas extraction wells, more than 
normal, and we've stopped taking that type of waste, so it will reduce in the future. The good news is, and we also have a scrubber technology at our flare that removes the sulfur. The good news is, unlike methane, which has a generation curve, a decay curve of a slow arc of about 20 to 30 years, the hydrosulfide goes up very quickly and then goes down quickly. It's starting to come down. Okay. So. That, now, yes. and my other question for Patty and maybe for Bruce is, did you get any sense while as you were working through this project of whether or not towns might want to work together? Yes, um, and thank you for that. That was one thing I did want to mention. Um, since Bruce's study has been completed, we've met a couple of times again, and um, it's very clear that um, all of the 14 towns do want to work together. Um, we've set aside $30,000 of this um, DLTA money for this year, to uh, put out an RFQ, to hire probably an attorney, um, to basically write an RFP that um, would say to the Bournes and the CMASs out there, this is um, the amount of waste we have to dispose of, and these are kind of the four corners of how we'd like to do it. What can you do for us um, in that regard, and, and what kind of offer, firm offer would you make to us in that regard? So we'll be working on that. Um, in terms of timing, I think the towns um, are looking to get in front of town meeting by 2012. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I've you know I've told talked to Dan and uh, Tom Greener about that. Mm -hmm. um, we are also pursuing recycling um, study funds. DP's been slow to release them this year, and I'm hoping that they will be able to fund that. Uh, so we'll see. But recycling is a really integral part of this as well, and I think. One advantage of the Bourne facility is that we can um, bring our MSW for disposal there, but we can also start working on separating out the waste streams so that we're compost composting compostables and bailing recyclables and, and all that. So I see that as a, a potential benefit there. And then um, finally, I just wanted to say that um, I'll be making the rounds after May, after the uh, town elections, and talking to all the boards of selectmen with Bruce's presentation, mm -hmm. basically. And um, just letting them know what the findings were, that we're going ahead and trying to move ahead as a group um, as we look at our disposal options going ahead. A couple of things I didn't understand. If there's a moratorium on incineration, what yeah. happens to seeds? Can well, they it, keep going? It's a, it, the moratorium is on new, new. facilities. Oh, new facilities. So there's uh, oh, okay. eight or nine existing facilities throughout the state that will stay and not be allowed to expand or grow or anything like that. So, and that's been in place since 93, I think, or so. You know, and other than incineration and landfills, what other kinds of technologies are there? Well, obviously, turning uh, the waste into energy. The, there's co-composting. You know, Nantucket does a lot of composting. and. Um, yeah, I was going to say, what can we learn from Nantucket? Yeah. Because they're, they're, Nantucket in the vineyard, their issue is, you know, having to uh, barge all yeah. their trash and everything from the islands. <clears throat> So it all comes to from it's going to be uh, it, on its way. But um, it, they have a vested interest in trying to do that so that they don't have to barge it out. So, I mean, I would love ultimately to see the Cape get to a kind of a zero waste mm -hmm. position like Nantucket is. Um, I think as a region, we have a real opportunity to do that um, eventually. Um, when you hear the Solid Waste Advisory Committee talk about it, they point out that the Nantucket facility is extremely in the red. Um, Bruce, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're not familiar with that facility. Yeah. I mean, I think that the issue in Nantucket is it caught, because of that haul, you know, so it's an yeah. almost three-hour boat ride, yeah. um, it, it, it's very, very expensive to, to take care of waste there. So their break-even point is a lot higher than you are. And right now, I think one of the things that sort of keeps away from that is that the towns are paying a $37 a ton, which is very low. Um, tip fee, and it's sort of built into all the fees. They've got all the structure in place to, to fund that. Um, and then when that goes, when that doubles in five years, that's you know that's really a, that's, that's really what drove. I mean, I was involved in Nantucket when they were planning this, mm -hmm. and that's what drove them to sort of hold as much as they possibly can. I mean, Pat, I can answer yeah. that too. Remember, we did before not this board. We did a study for Wellfleet. Um, Roger Putnam actually <coughs> got us to put some money up. And we did a study. Wellfleet was planning on doing mining of their current landfill and. They wanted to look at building a composting facility there, and we had actually Wright Pierce come and do some analysis of, of the viability of that. The issue is really cost. It's I think even back then the cost was 90 to 110 dollars a ton to make it viable. 
and you see that's even higher than the projected market cost right. going forward by 2015. Mm -hmm. So that's really, I think, part of the issue. I mean, I, I think there are some great technologies. This incinerator moratorium, and you know, Phil said it right, uh, correctly. I mean, I, it really cuts back on these technologies, which would have less emissions, would you know, would, would be much better for than than you know some of the things that are out there now. But but again, the other thing is, as far as today's you know United States market, Europe's doing some things. It's waste energy and landfilling, and very small percentages being you know, as far as disposal goes, uh, being handled in you know, coal composting. There's a county in New York, and there's a few spot places around there. But uh, but the other thing it requires is to be effective at these things is it would take a change on the residential level to separate, you have know, to do more separation of waste stream. I mean, it's a lot of work in San Francisco with going with a food, uh, organic waste, food waste, and organic waste separate collections that are just recyclables and waste and trash. <clears throat> is there a difference? You mentioned um, you had some commercial leases as well as um, municipal uh, or, or another town. Is there a difference in hauling? I mean, when we're talking about this, is this just mun mun municipal or uh, is commercial combined in that? I mean, do the numbers that they're talking about are from the residential mm -hmm. municipal solid, solid municipal. waste. Of course, there's commercial MSW. It's still called MSW, even though it right. comes from a business. Uh, that would be completely so separate. That's separate. So those are the businesses they're not under that, that negotiate these contracts? Is that, is that how that works? I mean, how do businesses... We've negotiated directly with hauling companies I that see. control accounts okay. that they pick up. Okay. That could include some residential waste. That would be the subscription right. okay. accounts or front end loaders behind a restaurant, things like that. Right. And so for our viable, we've signed short term two, three year deals with some of those haulers and then they go and collect it and bring it to us. Um, in the case of Falmouth, they, they hire a company, you know, I think it was waste management in recent years, to just pick it up and bring it to the transfer station. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, uh, you know, that's the way they do their transportation. But I think the tonnage Bruce is looking at is just the residents. And can I also ask, why is there a moratorium on these facilities? Is it because they're because of the emissions that they once well, Mass DEP has established a hierarchy of how to get rid of waste, right. reduce, recycle, and, and they just believe that they don't want to generate uh, additional waste energy. There's concerns about emissions, and, and, and you know, am I saying accurate or not? Concerns about emissions, and, and again, it's, a, it's somewhat political. It's right. definitely somewhat political. Yes. Part of it was mercury, <laughs> and right. I would tell you that CMAS has, has done a lot of work on reducing their mercury emissions in the last five years. I mean, enormous amount. I mean, something in the order of 90% reduction. Which but there's still, cons to yeah, there's still concern about mercury, but there's also, I think, some political concern that if you uh, expand it, then you're only encouraging, you're, you're not encouraging recycling and diversion and other techniques, and then you have to feed the debt with waste. Right, okay. there, was a, there was a moratorium up until four or five years ago on, on landfilling, maybe it's longer ago, but you know, there has been on landfilling municipal solid waste, this material, so that, now it got, that was waived uh, just basically to, to put those facilities in place. So it's, it really is the push, I think, you know, those correct. So you have a plan. You have a plan. After this, you're going to take it to the communities and see if we can't get... We do. Everybody's still together, still mm -hmm. working together. Um, the board option is on the table. CMAS, all the options are still on, on the, the table. table. And um, I think it's a great news that the towns want to, to hang together and move forward. To you. That's good. That's a, there's an important piece to this that uh, you, you do have to wait until after the May elections to see who's on board. However, the people that have the most influence, at least in Harwich, are the people who do this day in and day out. Mm -hmm. I think it might be useful if you previewed this with the DPW directors, you know, your, your presentation, and get some feedback from them so that when you do make the presentation to the new folks who will probably be seeing this for the first time and then take it under advisement mm -hmm. and go through the usual, you know, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to do better than that. Right? I'm going to bring them with me to the presentation. Cool. So, yeah. But, I mean, the, you could ask the towns to do it in a workshop session well, where the selectmen meet with the DPW people and all the people, right. and you all meet in the same room. Well, and everybody the, hears it at the same time. But most of the DPW guys are on the Solid Waste exactly. Advisory Committee, yeah. right? Yeah. That's yeah, why so it's important to them engaged in the presentation so that they could perhaps even participate yeah. in the presentation itself. Yeah, I already warned them they're going to be coming yeah. with me. Right. On the roadshow. Yeah. Any other 
question? No, I think that's no, that's been great. That's great. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the time. I also want to appreciate the fact that Phil did. Yes. I'm glad he did come in from the from the town of Bourne. And you know, and <clears throat> gave some information that would sort of fill this whole picture right. out because that is certainly a regional, uh, you know, service that mm -hmm. you know, that they have been providing and trying to provide, and I, and I think we need to take note of that. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. So thank you much. very much. Well, thanks Great. Very much. Solve it. <laughs> so, um, are you you're going to just reset that? Computer, right? Yeah, you're, okay, I can do sorry. my presentation. Well, should, should we, we still have time? Do I take a five minute break? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll take a five minute break while and, they and can hear you. Down. Well, we can actually, uh, you but then we can get started, started signing. Uh, that's are we going to ask Bruce? No, he just passed us up. Richard Gaines, though, in case you want, might want to join one of those groups. If me if I guess and just, you know, just, uh, you know, Laban mm -hmm. water supply right there. So, getting All right. through that. I've moved it. You moved it. No, I second it. Are those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed? Three in favor. Motion carries. We could start with it. That was the one. Yes, that's good. Or you might as well.